Hi, I'm Caroline Goulard. I've created two companies in the field of data visualization. I've been working for more than 10 years to build bridge between humans and data, and I'm very happy to host this new episode of The Bridge, the artifact media that makes data and artificial intelligence understandable for all. Today, I'm with Mathieu Ruif. Mathieu, hello. Hi, Caroline. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. So I'm uh, Mathieu Ruif. Uh, I'm an engineer by training, and I've been working for the past 15 years on uh, actually photo editing with a bit of AI, actually a lot of AI, is starting from smartphone and also going like to all platforms. And uh, yeah, it's been like a very interesting past years uh, working on photo editing as a CEO of and co-founder of Photoroom. Great, can you tell me the story of Photoroom? Of course. Um, yeah, so as I told you, my past is a lot of like working in startups and photo. And what happened is I was in 2014, I was working um, in a startup, Superflix, that was acquired by GoPro two years later. We were doing video editing for everyone, like your video memories from all the content you have as an individual. And well, I was at GoPro and we were doing a lot of AI for these apps. I was in charge of all the photo editing apps there. and. Well, it came to my mind like the creating visuals for to promote the app, to promote what I do, was very difficult. I have been working on Photoshop for 20 years, and at the same time, we had an amazing AI team on the side, and they were like they yeah they were doing incredible things, but that was just on paper and not like not to our users. And so I, I left GoPro to start Photoroom and to make all this AI for photo editing accessible to all. Really, the idea of Photoroom is to make studio quality photos accessible to everyone in the world. And so we started in 2019. All right, so you started working with AI quite soon. Yeah. Before the arrival of generative AI. Did it change a lot for you, this last version of this technology? Yeah, so the, it changed a lot. It's, I mean, it, yeah, it, the potential and all what you can do from it were, is now huge and amazing. It's not, it didn't change everything in the company. Actually, it was kind of a natural uh, step for us. So if we, uh, taking a step back in 2019, we started with doing background removal. So you start from a product or a photo and you create a white background. So that's pure AI. At least AI made it like 100x better. And we had a ton of success with that, especially there was the COVID part. So in e-commerce, it's really important to have this white background. The thing is, like, the white background and all you can do from that is not for everyone. Like, if you're if you're selling fashion, the white background is amazing. If you're if you're like selling food, then you don't want to like have a pizza on a white background. So, we had a good good success. We were like uh, leading and uh, like all around the world in 2022. But we we saw that for some users, like the background we were offering kind of looked like collage. And we saw this amazing tech from coming from uh, Dali at that point, uh, OpenAI. And we saw like that's exactly what our user want, and we started to apply it for, yeah, for the product and the photo we take. So you start from a photo, and then you create a, like a scene for it, and that's so we literally post the company when we saw that, like it was summer 2022, and say, okay, this is the future of photo editing. This is the biggest photo innovation in the past 10 years, in the in the yeah in the 10 years in the decade. And yeah, we jump on it, and we were the first to release this generative AI feature for e-commerce in 20, early 2022. All right, so e-commerce, is that your main use case, or are there some others? Right, so e-commerce is a big thing. Uh, for us, we started with reseller and now we address like everyone wants to sell online product. So we're the best at product photography, especially creating these, these scenes uh, for the product people are selling. So e-commerce is definitely a big thing for us. We have a Shopify app. We are pouring a lot of e-commerce website. So we start from mobile, but also import uh, already in this like e-commerce website. Then, I mean, we have 100 million downloads. So it's not all like e-commerce. We have a like casual users, we have creators using the app, we have uh, also restaurant owner, like for food, as I told you, and we go even bigger, like you have a, so Barbie, I'm sure you heard about the movie, they use our photo, the photo room tech to 
to create like a Barbie poster for all their community and they created this website used by 10 millions of, of users. So we go from like, we, we have very, very different use, case, use cases, but at the end of the day, what we do is you start from a photo and we make the photo look, look pro. Like uh, we elevate the, the photo um, uh, for our users. Right, and from your point of view, does it sounds more like a revolution or an evolution of those generative AI technologies? Well, I, I think it's a revolution in that case. Uh, and for us, it was a natural step because that's what the user were asking for and it really flowed for us. But I do think all you can create for gener from generative AI is like, a huge, huge change. Like, uh, uh, I mean, it's as big as I, I lived. I started my first startup with the uh, mobile revolution. So I was, I took the first iPhone class development at Stanford. I was on the campus to create a photo app, actually, and it was big. Like, uh, it was like the potential, all the usage. It take, took a few years, but it changed our life, changed the society. I think that's what we're seeing with the generative AI part. Like everything you can create, the way you can build things as a developer, the way you create as a designer, everything is changing. So you will become competitors of DALI or Midjourney directly? Uh, I think it's not, I mean, our core, our core audience is e-com. There might be some use case where we like, uh, it's, uh, you can use one or the other in some way. I think Midjourney is a very creative, like it's more up in the funnel. It's, it's quite technical, uh, you know, it's the more for, I see Midjourney more like a Photoshop uh, replace, uh, like a competitor like where you have to know what you want, you have to describe complex prompt. For us, it's really about the 500 million people that don't like or who are not amazing designer and how to give them like this, this value of creating amazing photos. And what I would say also as starting from e-commerce is our users, I mean, one of the problem of generative AI, at least today, is it hallucinates. So you have that with text, like you ask two plus three and it gives you six, you know? So it's, uh, or it kind of creates, you ask for a scientific paper that's talking about, I don't know, the latest uh, photovoltaic cells, you know, for uh, energy and it kind of creates something that doesn't exist. And you have the same for photo. So you, you can ask, you can put your, you can ask for like a, I don't know, a very good photo of uh, this, uh, this pasta dish, for instance. And well, maybe, if you ask Dali or Midjourney, maybe create pistachio from that. Like, you know, the problem with uh, hands, it's, it's like creating extra fingers. All this thing is hallucination. And that was one of the issues we faced with Photoroom when we launched the first generative AI tool in 2022. So people would put their product and, well, initially we would hallucinate. So we would create extra details. And it's fine when you're creative, but when you sell, then people like suggest, okay, it's not one of the photo and they return it. So for e-commerce, Dali, Midjourney, they don't work. So what we do is we take the photo, we remove the background, and then we just create the background, but don't create artifacts around, around the product. And that's, for e-commerce, it's like a requirement. So in that way, we are a bit different from uh, what they do. Um, but the field is moving so fast, so maybe we do text to image in the future, maybe they do a bit more what we do. So it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, moving fast. What I like with what you say is making everyone a creator thanks to those artificial intelligence uh, tools, which uh, is a bit like Steve Jobs in the early days when the computer was like a bicycle for the human mind to go where he cannot go without. And so how do you see these artificial tools like a change for the society, will we still live the same way, build companies the same way? Yeah, yeah. I think it changes a lot the way we work. Uh, I mean, I use, I'm, I know how to code and develop, for instance, but I, it's, like, I do not do that on a daily basis. So, same, I don't do like a photo editing on a daily basis. It helps me like very be very productive, and so I think you get access to a lot of well agencies. I mean, if you take the example of Autopilot too everyone 
So to, tomorrow you'll have entrepreneurs who have a, like a photo agency, accounting agency at Autopilot, uh, uh, finance, financing and data probably, and they can do that like they're by themselves. So it kind of removes the, the need for large teams in some cases. And we see that already with the internet, like entrepreneurship got the barrier to creation of a company got lower and lower. Today already, like most of sales on Shopify or Amazon Marketplace, there are like teams of five and less. So the future for me is really like acceleration of, an acceleration of that. And you'll have people by themselves doing like 10 millions in revenue alone. And a lot of one to five like teams, like uh, we have this explosion of small businesses, maybe 500 million, maybe 1 billion uh, small businesses. And, and they'll have all this uh, autopilot to help them on their daily job. Uh, because, and they can focus, they can focus on their craft, what they do, like, uh, I don't know, a restaurant, like uh, jewelry. And, but they have all these small assistants that help them. And when, when you think about it, like having a large corporation with like all this function, because of maybe of globalization has been like kind of a very short time, a uh, short period of history, like maybe 50, 60 years in the 20th century. So I think men love to be like a, a kind of a small group and work on that and be creative. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity for the society to be a, a bit more like, a, yeah, a bit, a bit more, a lot more entrepreneurship and a, a lot more creation. But how many people do we need to build Photo Room or Midjourney, Delhi? How many are you at Photo Room? Uh, today we're a bit more than 50. Um, I don't know the exact number for Midjourney, but I think they're a bit they're smaller. Uh, you have uh, OpenAI. I mean, is like <laughs> has a huge impact on the world. They're less than 500, maybe 600 now. Uh, but I mean, a few months ago they were less than 500, and so you. Yeah, you'll have more and more companies that are being very impactful. And there, there are some like, uh, I mean, that's what I see from AI. That's what I see in e-commerce. But you actually have like some numbers of like the revenue per employee is going up in a lot of companies, like as a general trend. So it does like uh, show uh, this is kind of a macro trend that's going to be accelerated with Gen AI, according to me. All right. So removing all the barriers from the person to the market like Amazon Marketplace did by allowing everyone to sell everywhere in the world. Yeah, those other yeah exactly. And uh, I mean, the, for, for Photoroom, we started as an iPhone app. And so we have all the platform now. But starting on an iPhone, like Apple made the full distribution of, uh, of Photoroom. So the, in 2020, I think 2019, the first country we were featured was Vietnam. Then we were featured in Japan. And it's really like you have marketplaces where you can distribute yourself. and. You, as an entrepreneur, you can focus really on the craft and building the product. And there are a lot of well, platforms to distribute, but auto, autopilot that will help you, help you build. So I think we really, yeah, it's going to be fascinating. And I think what I love, if you take the restaurant image on that, but jewelry hairdresser is the same, is everyone that started that's doing that as kind of a unique story to tell as like a, an artisan, as, a, as an entrepreneur. And so you have more diversity in commerce because everyone kind of, tell their story. And that's what we do with Gen AI at is the image you, we create for you when you, you, you do your marketing, you have your visual is unique. So, you know, that's the beauty of Gen AI. Like everyone has a unique story and Gen AI make, make sure that the visual story, the actually also the world story, that's not what we do, but the visual story is a single unique story for everyone. And I think it's beautiful that part. <laughs> Isn't it the final danger for you to have directly the iPhone or the other smartphone as competitors because they can embed those features directly into, into the device? Yeah, I mean, I've been working on photo apps for, well, like I told you, 15 years. And there are a few features that we invented at Stupiflix and then GoPro and now at Photoroom that, Go, that <coughs> Apple did after. Of course, when you do something smart, then they do it for the platform. I think what's important is to know what, what user you're focusing on. And so to give you the example of background removal, we, we started with background removal. Apple's put it on uh, the iPhone, I think, two, one or two years ago. 
well, we didn't see any change. And the truth is Apple is really focusing on making beautiful memories, beautiful photos. That's how they make ads in the in the all the capitals of the world of the world. We at Photon we are focusing on helping people like do their job. And so that might be 10% of all the photo you take, but it's a different need. Like it's what you do in a, in a studio, it's not what you capture in the, the real world. So all the features for that are different. Like Apple requires a lot of privacy uh, uh, and, and you can't, like, can't, put, can't put everything on the cloud, stuff like this. Uh, and so as focusing on e-commerce, you, you have a better, I mean, you do a different product. And so that's, that's kind of the strength. And you can't do like 1000 photos in two seconds on, on a, an iPhone because that's not what it's made for. And we do focus on this use case, which makes it like an amazing experience. And at the end of the day, time is money for professionals. So having this like focused experience that makes it work very well is, is important. So you, you've been at YC in the US. Can you tell us a bit how it was to be an entrepreneur in the United States and what's the difference for you between the United States scene and the French one? Yeah, I mean, so we did, uh, we did Y Combinator in 2020. And we love, I think the American tech scene is really good at telling a very ambitious story about they really help you do that sometimes sometimes for i mean at least for me as an engineer we i think we don't tell the full ambitious story when we we pitch our idea and our vision and so this really helps us and i mean they have like so many advice like why well, see people think it's just three months that it's like they helped you for all the life of your company so we still have calls with our Y combinator partner and um, yeah, it helps us a lot, set our vision, hires the first people for the company. The community is amazing. The knowledge that is shared in the company, the community is, uh, is, uh, is crazy. Now, if you look at the maybe, I mean, we're talking about generative AI. If you look at the generative AI space, well, you obviously have a lot, of, a lot more density, a lot more startups. You had like a, already a dozen, maybe a dozen unicorn on the generative AI space in the Silicon Valley. Uh, but Paris is not bad. Uh, Paris is actually doing pretty well. You, I mean, you have the office of, the main office of Hugging Face is in Paris. You have Mistral, uh, well, Photoroom, uh, Dust, so uh, Lighton. So you have a very good ecosystem. I think it's powered by, well, a good, uh, good university, critical math training. It's really good for AI. Uh, good labs like the Fair Lab that. Uh, and that uh, Yann Lequin from Facebook started. So all this talent density makes it a very good ecosystem. And we, and it's, it's very, I mean, for me, it reached like escape velocity and it can be independent and create amazing companies in the future. You even have like, I don't know if you heard, but uh, Poolside was like a, a um, developer tool assistant. Um, they moved from the US to France because the ecosystem is uh, really good. So, and it's that you have great talent. So, you know, it's it's quite like it's quite a good ecosystem. Are you planning to open offices in the US? Um, that's a good question. Maybe next year. Most of our customers are in the US, and now we're starting to have like a. So we did a partnership with um, with uh, Barbie. Uh, Netflix worked with us for their marketing campaign. Uh, we're working with some major marketplaces in the in the US. So, um, yeah, we might have a few people uh, there next year. And going back to the European scene, there is important discussion about regulation for generative AI and AI in general. Do you take part into this debate? What form does it take? Um, not, not directly. I think the ecosystem is great because we know like the government is listening. And so, I mean, we, when we are asked, we voice or what we think. Uh, personally, I'm afraid of, uh, for European startups, I'm afraid of regulatory capture. So, which means Every time like you have like a, a new tech, if you create a law, well, it's easier to adapt to the law when you have thousands of lawyers. And so the risk for me is like we create 
too much regulation, more regulation than the US. Uh, and then, well, who can handle the regulation? It's like existing players uh, who have like big resources, deep pocket, and they, they don't care. Like they, it's, it's fine and they can develop. And f but for the startups, it's very difficult to adapt. And it's a lot of, it's not only the money, but it's also the time you spend with the lawyers to explain what you do. And it's kind of, you can kill the, the ecosystem to have that. So yeah, I'm a bit afraid that we do more regulation that's necessary. Obviously, it's a debate we need to have, but we need to be aware that it's better to be creating the new technology that regulating it for us, for for the ecosystem, for the economy. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm really, I think we should like, uh, we don't know yet everything. It's better to regulate by the usage uh, than uh, like the larger language model, which would create a lot of burden on the tech ecosystem in, uh, in Europe. So what could be the necessary minimum? I think we have to be, I think like, like what everyone is saying and what was the initial version of the, the law was to regulate by usage. So if you're doing like a, a medical stuff, then you should be regulated. If you're, uh, but at the end of the day, it's like the usage that matters and not like the way, um, the way the, um, yeah, the, I mean, the kind of, you don't regulate code, you know? So you can, like a Python is not regulated because it's a powerful uh, 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 um, developer uh, platform. So um, I think the way to regulate is uh, the usage. I think open source is very important and people doing open source, they, they don't have resources, they don't have lawyers, so it's important not to block them. Uh, and uh, I mean, if they were to run for open source, Photom wouldn't be here because we always start from open source and then we train our model. We're also thinking of like actually training our own foundation model for image and release it to the community. But if it's blocked on the open source side, then I mean, it's kind of, it's, uh, gi it's giving back to the ecosystem. So if it takes extra money to give back, then you don't do it, you know? And so that's a real risk if uh, we regulate too much, I think. That's really interesting, this links with the um, open source environment. How do you, do you contribute? How do you contribute? Yeah. Um, I mean, a small startup is about focus, but I believe the open source part is going so fast on gener generative AI side that the real challenge for the research is to be close to is to be close to the open source. And so, for instance, we have the, on the background removal, we have the best. I mean, there are a few benchmark you can check, but we are the best in the world. And I think it comes from the fact that we're always close to like the research and the open source part. So we always like uh, every six months, every three months, we update our algorithm with the research. So close to the open source community. Um, now we contribute, like for instance, on the st uh, stable diffusion algorithm, we were the first to accelerate by 100% with open source contribution, all this model. So we, we do contribute on the main trunk because if you stay close to the main trunk and you have a branch, then if the trunk is higher, your branch will, will get higher. So that's. So you said you have an engineer degree. How do you see the evolution of the education for engineers, but maybe also for all the other students to be able to yeah, to deal with this new generative AI? Yeah. Um, I think it's going to change a lot of things. Uh, it's interesting because, yeah, my dad did engineering school in the beginning. He's the uh, surgeon, now, but he started and he was doing industrial des design and something that. 20 years later it doesn't exist as a class and I think we'll have a lot of things that don't exist today that will be uh, uh, that people will learn in school in 20 years um, and yeah it's uh, like I think we'll have a gen AI native like a uh, population generation that will do things differently like my kids are already using uh, I have three kids they're already using uh, chat GPT uh, at least the eldest on a on a daily basis and they they are learning from that. They are having like uh, fun. So my eldest, she is creating uh, drawings, uh, for instance, for her and all her classmates uh, from uh, ChatGPT. And you know, the future is going to be, yeah, actually it's going to be like other tools that you use. Like we say we Google something, but if you'll probably ChatGPT something in five years. We're, our mission at Photoroom is like uh, Photoroom, we make it to the dictionary, like you'll Photoroom something. Uh, if you need a photo, so it's, uh, I think it will change 
a lot on how we learn and how our brain works. You know, has having access to information like at the tip of your finger for a mobile for our generation, like mobile uh, first generation, change a lot on how we see culture. Uh, you everything you, every time you have a debate, like you, you kind of search the information. Now it's kind of reasoning, so it's kind of expands your brain on what you can think about uh, with uh, like a constant assistant. The question I have is like, okay, you take the expert, for instance, in development, uh, Karpati, for instance, in AI, he use uh, GitHub Copilot and ChatGPT, all the developers at Photorum, they use all these tools for more uh, efficiency and they don't get worse. Like if the best use it and they get more productive, it's logical that they use it. But the question for the next generation is, can they get the fundamentals when it's that easy to create something? And, and I guess like people would say the same thing on the internet 30 years ago, so I'm quite like, optimistic on that, but you, you, you can't help but wonder what's going to happen here. How it's going to be, how are we going to learn in the future, you know, all, all these things. <coughs> so it's a big, big unknown, but I think it's important that we adapt and we learn how to use this tool. And the best way to learn is to like be using them uh, and Leverage and uh, leveraging them in the daily basis, I think. You have a very optimistic vision, and it's uh, great in comparison with a lot of people who are a bit scary, afraid of this generative AI possibilities. Yeah, I'm. I'm, <coughs> I'm very optimistic. I am a bit. I'm, I think I'm aligned on uh, the vision that we don't have. Like uh, we have many years before we have a like a uh, general intelligence that and I don't think we see a lot of like uh, pessimistic movies I think pessimistic movies sell so it doesn't need to be the, the full uh, story <coughs> so I, I think overall I'm yeah I'm quite optimistic on what we can do because you can create so much and and yeah that's I mean working in the startup ecosystem like you always have to reinvent yourself so I think that's the fun part of being in this ecosystem but it's true that for a lot of people who have job today, they have to like you have to ask yourself like uh, like uh, how can I do my job tomorrow and maybe reinvent. So they're going to have like it's moving so fast that it's going to change a lot in the current generation. I think on how we work, and that's the goal of the society, the government, to make sure like these people are not left on the side, and we we provide like a way to teach them how to use it and. And yeah, and the, but the best way at the end of the day to not be afraid of a new technology is to, to use it, play with it and see all you can create with it, I think. And so what's the next revolution? How do you see this field evolving for four or five years? Um, yeah, I think... I'm very excited about multimodal and video, but yeah, multimodal is you know the idea that you can leverage different form of content at the same time, photo and text, <coughs> that the AI can read the photo and understand and do things from that. For me, this like the next year is going to be a lot, like they're, they're, we're going to be surprised by the service you can create for multimodal. Like we have hackathons every three months at Photoroom, and the things the team has built were like phenomenal. And so there'll be like many services that help many people coming from the multimodal approach. And then in five years, I think you can have like a, yeah, new ways, new, <coughs> new product we haven't imagined actually, that we don't know yet what it is, but coming from this, uh, so easy to build something new. And what's impressive, I mean, you've seen ChatGPT, it goes from one, zero to 100 million in less than six months. So massive distribution. So um, I'm yeah, very excited about the new tools that we are going to help everyone. Like, uh, as I say, this idea of like small startups, small entrepreneurs doing so much with all this, uh, this autopilot, I think we'll see that a lot. So Mathieu, what would be your recommendation for people who would like to explore further this subject? You have like a book or article, a video? Yeah, I am. I love like uh, learning by doing. So I think my first recommendation would be to use uh, these tools, use use uh, Photoroom, of course, use uh, ChatGPT, and 
yeah, I try to remove the friction of like using it. So I use, I mean, the fact that you can talk to it, take photos, like really exchange with ChatGPT now is amazing. I use Gemini from Google, maybe, you know. So really, this I love this quote of like, the future is already here. It's not evenly distributed. And you can actually so live in the future using this and remove these tools and understanding what, what is, is it we're going to build from that. And so my first recommendation is using the tools. I think... I would say, I think Sequoia, I mean, the investors from the US, Sequoia Benchmark, they wrote some very interesting articles on the uh, second phase, like step two of generative AI, um, especially of about the user interfaces um, of the product we're going to, we're going to use. If I can explain a bit that for photos, um, I think today you have a lot of people like for photos or chat actually putting like a text box on top of a, a generative model. And that's just because it's the early days and it's the easiest thing to do. I think in the future, you have like new product, new interfaces that are going to be built with Gen AI. And that's going to be fantastic. Like, uh, it's, uh, yeah, and that's what we see at Photoroom. Like you don't want a text box to create images. You want to move things around and that's, that's what we built. The last part, what I'm really excited about, uh, yeah, uh, multimodal, uh, I think I told you just earlier, but the idea of photos plus text and understanding even videos and putting all of that together, it's going to be amazing. The next phase in the, I mean, five years is, uh, I think it's moving around the reality, uh, the kind of having a robot that has, like, can train and learn from generative AI. It's going to be like understanding physics is kind of the next breakthrough we need to, to achieve. That's maybe five years, not for next year, I think. Mathieu, thank you very much. Thanks, Arlene. I hope you enjoyed this episode and see you very soon for a next episode of The Bridge. <laughs>